Before we uh, go to a time where we hear the Word of God, uh, I just want to make one quick announcement, uh, which is about uh, Alpha Online number two, right? Which will be held on the 6th of September. 6th of September, we will be having online, uh, Alpha Online number two. And this is a wonderful platform for us to be able to declare the gospel of Jesus, proclaim the gospel of Jesus and its transforming power to our family, to our friends. And so Lord, I want to encourage you all uh, uh, to invite your friends. Now there are posters available which you can use to promote Alpha Online and these posters can be found of course in uh, you know the WhatsApp group that we have, the WhatsApp SSGC Notice Board WhatsApp. Now you can access the posters there or you can head on to our website and the posters will be available there as well. Right? So feel free to use those posters and to share about our Alpha Online, get more people to come 6 September so that they can also come and experience the goodness and the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen? All right, now without further ado, can I please invite our dear brother, Kun Wing Kit, who will share with us the Word of God. Now, as he comes, let us all praise toget- uh, pray together. Right? <laughs> praise God. Uh, of course, every now and then, our brother also needs a, a word of praise. La, huh? <laughs> but let us pray for him as well. Now, if you want, you can stretch out your hands. But most importantly, let's stretch out our hearts to the Lord for our dear brother here. Father in heaven, we thank you for your servant and for your beloved child, our brother Kun Wing Kit. We thank you that you have called him here. It is not by accident. It is by divine purpose that he is standing here. You have appointed for him to share your word with us today. So Lord, we pray that our hearts will be tuned to you. Our ears will be attuned to your voice. Lord, we pray that your word will go forth mightily today, Lord and it will take flight on the wings of the Holy Spirit, Lord, so that the Word will transform us, so that the Word will work in and through us, that everyone who listens to your Word today will experience the transforming grace of Jesus Christ. Be with our, uh, our dear brother as he speaks, and may his mind, his heart, his lips, his whole being be taken captive to Christ, so that, Lord, that he will preach under the anointing and the empowering of the Holy Spirit. We ask this and pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Thanks, brother. Good morning, church. Yeah, it is a joy that I can speak this morning, and I'm very encouraged that the church is actually open. And I'm even more encouraged that I think nearly all the seats are taken up uh, in the church. Whoa, let's give a clap. And I think... uh, Maybe in another few weeks, I hope to see maybe the church can be filled again. And I'm actually looking forward that the church can restart and that we can meet in one or two services again. And I can't wait to give a hug to my friends I haven't seen for the last 163 days. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know who are they? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, I've been given the honor to speak this morning and the topic given to me in January 1st was actually about baptism. Yeah, and but since baptism has been postponed uh, due to the MCO, I have been given a free topic. And my message this morning is very simple, and it is something very close to my heart, and it is also in line with baptism, and it is about restarting, rebooting, and restarting. It is about how are we going to restart post-MCO. And I would like to title my passage this morning as r and yeah. Do you all know what's r and Yeah, okay. Who likes an r and here? Raise your hand. Okay, good, good, good. The rest, all of you all, you know, uh, okay, I think too much, rested too long already, I guess, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, my r and this morning is about reboot and restart, or do you want to retreat and regress? Yeah, so... A question that I would like to raise to the congregation and those who are at home. How many here is excited that the COVID pandemic is tapering off and RMCO is coming to an end? Raise your hand. Great. Some of y'all, yeah, still wants to work from home, huh? Yeah. You see, very soon, RMCO will be removed and you will return to your normal life. And there's a quote that's going into my office that I can't get it on my, my head is that say, do not let a good crisis go into a waste. And it's been swirling my head. And uh, yeah, 
But my question to the church this morning, what have you learned through this pandemic and RMCO? And how are you going to restart your life after the pandemic leaves and after the RMCO has been taken back? Are you just going to jump back where you stop? Or are you going to reboot and restart? Yeah. So it was about 140 days, uh, sorry, 163 days actually, since we were hit with MCO, and a lot of things are not the same anymore. You see, the first four months, uh, six months, uh, five months actually, there was a lot of shaking, and a lot of realities were redefined, and certain truths were revealed both in our lives and in the church on what foundation we were building on. And on a more humorous side, uh, let me share with you what I learned uh, during RMCO. Uh, I learned that I can't dance, you know. You know, the first two months of RMCO, right? Uh, you can't jog because Joy said the police will catch you. And I was going sideways, yeah. So I decided to follow her in doing her online aerobics, online Zumba, online hits. And uh, if I could say, if the dogs could laugh in my neighborhood, they will laugh all the time, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, on a more serious note, okay. There are a few things that I've learned during the MCO. One, uh, just something to ponder, the simplicity of life, yeah. You see, life can be quite simple, you know, yeah. You see, I work from home and I don't need to get dressed in the morning and I don't need to wear my Armani, drive my BMW to impress somebody whom I do not like. Yeah, not that I have a Beamer and Armani, yeah. But there's a quote that goes by a very famous financial guru. You just say, in the present age, in the 21st century, a lot of times we buy things we do not need with the money we do not have to impress the people we do not like. Yeah. So the MCO revealed that life is actually not that complicated. What do we need? We just need shelter, we need food, we need fellowship, and we need income for sustenance. And about friendship, what do you learn about friendship? You will notice, right, during the MCO, those who maintain connect, remain connected with you are those who you can consider as your good friends. In Proverbs 18.24 says, there are friends who stick closer than brothers and it works along with trust. You know, those who are, we know that our, who are our friends, we can trust when they were there to journey with us during these tough times. Yeah. And something that I learned about consumerism. You know what, friends? I don't need a BMW, I don't need a Birkin's bag when I'm stuck at home, not that I have one, but sometimes I just need a grab food and my wife, you know. Life is as that simple, you know. I do not need too many things and that is what matters. I do not to, need to overconsume. And finally, certain things that I learned, idols. RMCO was a time that I managed to take some time out to reflect, to pause and to rest. What were the idols in my life? What was I actually chasing? Was it my career? Was it money? Was it my next investment? Was it something that I can buy next? Yeah. So this is something that I had to consider and something that I thought that a small COVID virus can turn our lives and community upside down. You see, the fact of the matter is that as we come out from this shaking, some of us will come out changed. Some of us, normal. But some of us will come out struggling. You know, for the businessmen, uh, some of them I spoke to, some of my friends that's in the uh, uh, food industry, you know, they are struggling. How am I going to pay my supplier? How am I going to pay the wages of my, my staff? How am I going to collect what I sold? You know, and for some of us, the question is that, would I have a next job in the next six months? Will my salary be reduced? Can I pay the salary? Can I, can I pay for my loan? Can I pay for my rental? My kids are going to the university. Am I able to pay them? So these are the fear that is happening in our lives because of the MCO. And my topic this morning is about, about reboot and restart, is to challenge us as a church and also as believers for both old and new to think through as we come out from this MCO, how should we restart our life and the church in SSGC? And if you're zooming out there from other churches, it's something that you should consider too. Yeah. So before uh, I'm going to start now, I'm just going to open with a word of prayer. Yeah. Our Lord Jesus, we invite you this afternoon, Lord, to minister to us with your word. 
For your word is powerful, Lord. It goes forth, Lord, and shall not come back void as spoken in Isaiah 51, Lord. And Lord, let our hearts be fertile ground to receive, to anoint our lips, to anoint my lips as I'm being used as your mouthpiece to speak to your people. And may the Holy Spirit, Lord, speak to every individual in this hall, in our homes, Lord, in our families, as we commit our minds and our heart to your word this afternoon. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. My first point on rebuilding is about repentance. Friend, it's going to be a very hard start, yeah. And my point about rebooting is about starting with repentance. And I'd like to bring to thought on the book of Acts, which we have been studying for the past two months. And this has been shared two to three weeks ago by Brother Colin Wong and also Brother Shamugan on the need for us to repent and also to return to the Lord. And you may ask, why repent? Because the first principle when we repent is that we allow God to work in us again. If I could bring to recollection for the past one month what we studied, Acts chapter 2, in the first message when Paul spoke to the Jews and the Holy Spirit came, was a message to remember the prophetic work and the life of Jesus coming to earth and he was crucified and raised to life. And the people, when they heard, they were torn and they asked, Peter, what should we do? And you see, what were their response? Let's read together. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Peter replied to them. Let's read. Eh? One, two, three. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the, for the forgiveness of your sin, that you may receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord your God will call to himself. You see, when the people heard the message, they were touched. They did not just comment, hey, yeah, it's a good message, man. Wow, I'm quite amazed. And then they forget. You see, they heard the message and they responded. And they responded with what? They responded with repentance. And you know what? With repentance, the Lord then blessed them with a gift. And that gift was the Holy Spirit, which was given to the new believers and their household, the promise, not just you, your household, and all those who believe so that you can be empowered by the Lord. And in Acts chapter 3, shared by, I think, Brother Colin, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, uh, when, when uh, Acts chapter 3, 19, 20, Peter spoke in the temple itself, in Solomon's portico, and when he spoke to the Jews, what did he say? First thing, repent, therefore, turn back, that your sins may be blotted out and times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord that he may send the Christ appointed for you. So this again is a message that Peter gave to the new Jews in Jerusalem. Repent, turn to God so that your sins are wiped off and times of refresh, refreshing returning to you. I don't know about you, but sometimes I want times of refreshing. And if you want times of refreshing, you have to repent and return to God. Yeah. And when you raise your hand to say, I repent, Lord, it is saying to the Lord, Lord, I'm sorry, please forgive me and use me again. And this will allow you, this will allow God to work in us again. There's a quote, uh, I think one of the speakers in this uh, church spoke. He said, remorse without repentance lead to regret. Yeah. Remorse with repentance lead to redemption. Yeah. Remorse without repentance lead to regret. Remorse with repentance lead to redemption. My question this morning, if I may challenge you, if you were standing before God right now and He asked you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? Why should I let you into my heaven? Yeah. Something to think about and something to think that it is by God's grace and mercy and the blood of Jesus Christ we can enter heaven. And repentance allow us, allows God to change our way. And we must recognize of our lostness and know that we have nowhere, no one to turn to and only Jesus can save you. And then we will stretch out our hands and say, Jesus, save me. And we allow God to work again in our life. 
And as a church, a challenge is that we have to allow God to work in our church and we must repent. Many times we have done the church things according to our ways, my ways, yeah. And we must repent if we have put activities before Christ in our ministry, in our church, in our care groups. And we repent and we must reach out our hands to our Lord Jesus to allow Him to begin work in our lives and in our church again. There's a saying that only a drowning person will reach out to a saving hands. That is why repentance is important. It allows God to work in us again. My point number two is that, uh, this is something very exciting, repentance. With repentance, we are acknowledging, we are heading the wrong way and turning back to God's way. And there's two things, uh, two stories I'd like to share. It was taught to me by my Sunday school teacher, which I always remember. Sorry, not uh, my youth teacher, actually, uh, Brother Paul Long. You know, the two examples where we can see on King Saul and King, uh, King David, when they were confronted by the prophet, Prophet Samuel and Prophet Nadan on the scenes they've done, what were their response? Yeah. So for King Saul, he was instructed by God to destroy the Amalekites and everything in it. Do not take anything. Destroy it one to one hundred. But you know what? When they defeated the Amalekites and, they, and, and uh, defeated them, in uh, sorry, 1 Samuel 15, uh, verse, uh, yeah, 1 Samuel 15, verse 15, they, it, it stated that they did not destroy everything. They kept some sheep, you see, and uh, they kept some sheep, fattened calf, maybe it's Wagyu, Marble 5 or whatever, yeah. But they disobeyed the Lord. And when prophet, uh, prophet Samuel confronted King Saul, this is what his response was. 1 Samuel 15, verse 16. And Saul answered Prophet Samuel. He said, These soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best sheep and the cattle to sacrifice to your God, but we totally destroyed the, the rest. I read that again, just so they can catch. These soldiers brought them out from the Amalekites. They spared the best sheep and cattle to sacrifice to your God, but we totally destroyed the rest. You will notice that when Prophet Samuel pointed out to King Saul of his sin and wrongdoing, his response was, these soldiers, they spared to sacrifice to your God. You see, Paul's heart was not repentant. You know, He was saying that, hey guys, I'm not wrong. It's their fault, the soldiers' fault. They spared the ship, you know, and they brought it up to sacrifice to your God. Yeah. And you know what? There was a rebuke by, uh, by, by Prophet Samuel. Because of that, right, he was uh, stripped out from his kingship. But you see, uh, in comparison to King David, yeah, no, sorry, I, I have something written here first. Yeah. So you will notice that's very interesting in our life when we sin, right? It's so easy for us to point out that it is not my fault. I sinned because he made me do it. He offended me first, you know. I sinned because she tempted me. I stole because everybody is doing it. What's wrong? Yeah. So we must acknowledge that we have sinned and then the Lord will start to work in our life. In comparison to King David, when he was uh, told by Prophet Nathan of his sin against Bathsheba, what was his response? The first response for uh, King David in 2 Samuel 12 verse 13 was, David said to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. And Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. You see, the Lord responded immediately when he said, I've sinned. And he just said that, yeah, I, uh, you, I've taken away your sin and you're not going to die. So our God is a gracious God and his steadfast love never ceases. And they are new every morning. Yeah. So the example I would like to say here is that uh, under Second Chronicles 7 verse 14, this is a promise from the word of God to say that if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. Our Lord is a gracious God. 
and He will forgive us and heal our lives, heal our church, heal our families, and heal our land. Yeah. There's a quote also that says that the sin that you're most defensible about would be the most destructive. Yeah. We dabble with sin and we ask God to come in when it's convenient and when we need Him. And our repentance is just not saying, Lord, I'm sorry, please forgive me, but it involves a change of direction. It's just not saying, I'm sorry, Lord, but you have to change your direction, going back to God's direction. If I may share to you uh, just an analogy, you know, or a quote. You see, you can't have a good intention with a wrong direction, you know. A wrong direction will not lead you to a correct destination. Just for example, if I want to eat the best durian in the world in Raob, I cannot be going driving down to Johor. Because if I drive down to Johor, I will end up eating oil palm, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, so a good intention does not equate to a destination. Direction will lead you there. And direction, not intention, will determine your destination. And also direction will allow you to avoid unnecessary detours in your life. Yeah. So repentance is important because you say that, Lord, forgive me, I'm heading the wrong direction and I want to follow you again. And you know what? I'm so thankful that our God is a God of second chance. I've seen so many times, fought so many chances, and God say, once you forgive, confess your sin and return to Him, He will just accept you as it is. And the promise I just want to assure you this morning is in 2 Chronicles 14, uh, 7 verse 14, it says, I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins and I will heal your land. The Lord will heal you. And if you, in Acts chapter 3 verse 19, He say, repent, turn to the Lord, and your sins will be wiped away. And you know what? Times of refreshing will come from the Lord. And this is the promise from the Lord to you if you repent and turn to Him again. My point of number two about rebooting, it is about returning to your first love. You know, I'd like to share with you Matthew 22, verse 37. Yeah, let's read together. It's a very short verse. Matthew 22, verse 37. Let's read this. One, two, three. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest commandment. Yeah. Uh, the first and greatest commandment. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Friends, this is the instruction from our Lord Jesus Himself. You know what? As individuals, right? God put you first. Are you putting God first? That's the question. What is the condition of your love for God? Yeah. You may ask, hey, kid, you may ask the elders, your care group leaders, how do I love God every day? Think about it. Yeah. You know what? Those who have uh, not lived long enough, I noticed that when I was young, I thought love was a feeling. But actually, love is a decision. You know what? Love starts with a spark. And you know, it's sustained through your decision and it's maintained through our actions. And it's not just a feeling. You know, when the, there's a joke that I still remember, when a man opens the car door, it's either the car is new or the girlfriend is new. Yeah. <laughs> but if you see a man, a husband, open the car door to, for his wife, and he dress up very nice, wears his cologne, brushes his teeth, and treat her well, well, this is a reflection. It's an outward expression of his inward dedication. You know? So the question is that how are you loving God every day? A simple one, I, I, I will elaborate more. One is that we must pray, we must commune with God, talk to God, listen from God, you know. Uh, and then after that, the second one is the word. You must read the scripture, fill your life with the promises of the scripture, and renew your mind. Sometimes thoughts that come in they are negative, you need to assure them with the word of God. And you have to worship, listen to hymns, or maybe praise song. Praise God for who He is and rest upon His assurance. And as you worship, He will speak to you. Yeah. And finally, about works. I will elaborate more after this. You have to obey His command and do His work. Yeah. So friends, to reboot, one of the first steps is to remember to love your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. 
And I just want to share a bit about, uh, just came to my mind about the church. What does it mean to our church to love, to, to love your, uh, to, uh, to return to your first love? And this was shared on uh, NECF 40 Days Prayer and Fast Booklet. And I'd like to read to you uh, in Revelations 2, verse 1 to 5. And this is a reminder to our church that we have to be careful. Revelations 2, 1 to 5. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These are the word of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walk among the seven golden lampstem. I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but not, and found them to be false. You have persevered, you have endured hardship for my name, have you not gone weary? Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. You know what? Every church, we have our own personality. We have our identity. We have our gifts. We have our atmosphere. But regardless of all this, gifts and personality, right? One quality that beautifies the church is love. Yeah. The church of Ephesus was not a new church, I believe. Yeah. I, don't, I know it's not a new church. It was a well-established church, sound doctrine. I'm sure every believer attend church regularly every Sunday. They knew their doctrines, celebrated the Lord's Supper, rejected false prophets, did good deeds, carried out their responsibility, lived an upright life, prayed, sang hymns, but the Lord was not pleased with them yeah, because they lack of, their, lack of love. So my question to the church this morning is that, what are we worshipping in church? Yeah, so very important. What are we worshipping? Are we worshipping our culture? Are we worshipping another church? If we, are forget, if we have forgotten our first love, we have to wake up. And no, you know, how do we return? It's about repenting, and do the things you did at first. At times, we are so preoccupied with the work of the Lord, we forget to and begin to forsake our first love. And God's warning to the church that He will remove the lamb stem if we forget our love. And why is the lamb stem? Lamb stem shines the light, and the church represents the light of Christ shining to the world. If the lamb stem is removed from the church, the, lurch, the church has lost its ability to illuminate Christ and we do not want to fall into a condition of 1 Samuel 21 where uh, a child was named as Ichabod. The glory of the Lord has left and the church becomes sterile without the ability to influence the community and the people around them. You know, Colin struck me with a statement two weeks ago. He said that, you know, the church can be like a dry well, a promise of hope, but no resemblance of earlier days. Yeah. So it is important we do not forget lest we as church are blotted from the Lord's bless blessing and His word. Principle number two, I would like to share about returning to your first love. Wow, it's a handful. It's about the deeds does not matter if your heart is not in the matter. Okay, I think I wrote this myself. Deeds does not matter if your heart is not in the matter. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, all right. Let's see what I can do. <laughs> you see, in, in choosing David, yeah, David was chosen as the next king when uh, King Saul failed, okay? And the Lord sent Samuel to the house of Jesse to see his seven sons, to choose one to be the anointed king. And all the sons came, one, second, third, fourth, fifth, and the seventh son came, and it was Eliab. And in 1 Samuel verse, chapter 16, verse 7, uh, Samuel probably thought, wow, this guy looks handsome, tall, sturdy, looks quite well do. I think this is the one. But you know what? The Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature because I've rejected him. And I want to hear this. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks into the heart. You see? The Lord sees what is in a man's heart, not just physically. 
And as a church, right, it is a challenge to me, right? What drives us to do what we do in church? And is our love getting cold in church? And one of the signs that we are losing love in church is that, you know what? We become indifferent. Indifferent of good and evil, indifferent of truth and error. And we sometimes, I tell you, maybe we become slothful. Slothful in doing God's work with no sense of urgency or dedication. And number three, then we start to have a sinful decline. A sinful decline is where we begin to tolerate small sins. When God chose David among Jesse's seven sons, he was not the strongest, not the tallest, not the most able-bodied, not the most handsome. But God chose David because he has a heart after God's heart. And you know what? He had a shepherd's heart. He cared for the small things which led him to be a responsible king to lead the whole nation. So as a church, my challenge to you is that, you know what? Your heart is very important. God is interested in the individual's heart before service and he looks into the heart. And do not turn our love for Jesus into a duty. Instead, turn it to a delight. And your love is a devotion to Jesus. And your devotion should be fervent and should be personal and unreserved. And we must love Christ so passionately in order that when we serve Him, we serve Him faithfully and wholeheartedly. And this is a challenge that we have to keep our heart warm. And my third point in restarting now is that we have to restore God as King. How do we restart? Yeah, We have to put God as our King in our lives and in our church. And how do we do that? The first thing on restoration, we have to remove idols in our life. We have to remove... You might say, hey, do I have idols in my life? My first question to, uh, to the church and also when I was preparing to myself, in your life, there is only one throne and one king. Who is on the throne? Who is on your throne in your life? Yeah. Is it you? Is it me on the highway? I'm the master of my destiny. Is it money? Is it my career? Is it my family? Is it my next investment? Or is Christ sitting on the throne in your life? Something to think about. And as a church, who is in God's throne in SSGC? Is Jesus Christ sitting on the throne? Or is the throne empty? Or have we allowed weeds to creep out to the throne? Yeah. And I, as I ask you this, I'm also asking myself, uh, do we put God on the throne and we kick God out at our convenience? And sometimes we kick God out by putting in habits that are destructive. Yeah. And how many of us put in habits that will lead us to God? Or do we expose ourselves to habits that will make or break our faith? Yeah. I'll just share with you Matthew 12, 43 to 45. This is uh, a sharing that what happens when an unclean spirit leaves a man. I'll just read it for you. Matthew 12, 43 to 45. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes to dry places, seeking rest and find none. Then he says, I will return to my house which I came. And when he comes and finds it empty, swept and put in order, and he goes and takes to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they will enter and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. The Bible says that unclean spirit is expelled from a man's house, wanders and homeless and return to the house where he was expelled. If he finds it empty, he will come back with seven other spirits. How do we apply this? In our life, if we do not allow the Holy Spirit to dwell in our life, it's like having an open door. Open door to invite unclean spirits to come in again. This is the word of God spoken by the Lord Jesus himself. You know, when we receive Christ, we must purge out all our old self, which is controlled by the spirit of the air. Ephesians 2 verse 1. We must claim the authority that we have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Receive the Holy Spirit and let Jesus heal you and the Holy Spirit to guide you and transform you to a new person, 
to be reborn again, to purge out your old self. If I may use an analogy, you know, uh, in an election, because election is coming. You see, let's say party P won an election and he will tell, hey, party B, don't worry, just continue to remain in the parliament, remain in the government and everything will be all right. No, it will not happen. Transformation will not happen. It will be a disaster because there's no change at all. If you do not change in your heart and that Holy Spirit will work, no change will happen. So the question I have is that, what are the idols which needs to be removed in your life as individual? And as a church, what are the idols that need to be removed in the church? And I'm also saying in fear and trembling, actually, we have to be mindful of the things we do in church. Sometimes there are things to be adore or worship or practice, not knowing that we have displaced the centrality of Christ, the Holy Spirit and the scriptures in our church worship. And this is so important that every leader must be sensitive and aware to ensure we do not fall to the entrapment. The entrapment is that we worship the form and we forget the master. Yeah. And you know what? Uh, just a small sharing that decay actually starts uh, in small steps. We do not destroy ourselves uh, one shot. We destroy ourselves with many small steps. And with one final big step, we self destruct. Yeah. And you know what? If it is a challenge for you to restart, I think. Let's come to the Lord as individual, as family, and as a ministry leaders and come to the Lord this morning and say, Lord, I remove the idols in my life this morning, in my ministry, in church, and I want to restore you as king again. And the promise that the Lord says is from Revelations. I just want to quote Revelations 3, 20 to 21. The Lord says that, Behold, I stand at the door and knock Anyone who hears my voice and open the door, I will come and eat with him and he with me. And the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father at his throne. So friends, just think about it. We have to remove the idols in our heart. Number two, finally, about restarting, we have to rebuild our walls. Yeah. We have to rebuild our walls. You know what? Actually, uh, I got this idea from a series of uh, sermon that I've been hearing lately, and I was intrigued on the walls of Jerusalem that needs to be rebuilt by Nehemiah. And after 70 years of exile in Babylon, the Lord allowed the Israelites to return, the Jews to return to Jerusalem. But the whole Jerusalem walls was in ruins. And Nehemiah, after surveying it, uh, he came and then he said, let's start rebuilding. And I just read through Nehemiah 2, verse 17 to 18. This after surveying the wall and he spoke to the Jews. Then he said to them, the Jews, you see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruin and its gates has been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them, told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and the king had said to me, and they replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began a good work. You know, the Jerusalem walls was in ruins and Nehemiah cried out to the Lord for strength to rebuild. And you may ask, why walls are so important? Yeah, why are walls so important? So this is what I learned. You know what? If you, a city without walls actually lives in fear. Just imagine you're living in this city and there are no walls, no defences. What will happen? The robber or the enemy can come anytime to plunder, steal, kill, and destroy. And a city without walls is also easily defeated. You know what? The enemy can come anytime, overcome you, take your family away, take your community, and occupy your household. That is why wall is so important. You know what? And you may ask, what, are you, what walls are you talking about, kid? And what walls do we need to rebuild? This afternoon, we are talking about building a spiritual wall if you do not have a spiritual wall, you will have a defeated mindset. You know what? 24 hours, I, I'm out there with the world, 12 to 15 hours, and get bombarded with so many values and issues. And if 
we do not fill ourselves with our spiritual walls right, I think we will be defeated. Our minds will be easily influenced by the world values. And our construction of the city walls does not just happen by coincidence, you know. It is a step-by-step, stone-by-stone construction. And sometimes also we need to remove the big debris in our life. I'm just saying like a stone when you rebuild, you need to remove that debris to enable you to reconstruct because sometimes there are things in your life that is blocking you from constructing something that is strong for the Lord. And you know what? When we build right, what is the most important? The cornerstone should be our Lord Jesus Christ. First Peter 2, 4-5. I just want to share with you, he said, As I come, the living stone rejected by human, but chosen by God and precious to Him, you also, like a living stone, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And you might say, how can I rebuild my spiritual wall? Well, there is no shortcut. Yeah. The, the success is in the process. Yeah, this is a quote that I take from another speaker. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it sticks in my head. Certain things in my head, I always remind, remind myself. We rebuild our spiritual walls through spiritual discipline. And uh, NECF 40 Days Prayer uh, booklet on fasting, I, I just want to share with you the analogy that struck to me too. In the Old Testament, the high priest in Exodus 30 has the responsibility to enter the holy place two times a day. And what does he do when he enters? He trims the wick, he pours in fresh oil, and he removes the impurity from the golden lamb stand. And this is an occasional effort. It is, sorry, this is a constant effort, not occasional effort. And this is to ensure that the lamb will not grow dim, nor flicker, or will never be extinguished. So as individual and as a church, we are the lamb. You, your lamb needs to be poured with fresh oil. Your wheat needs to be trimmed and impurities need to be removed. Yeah. And you may ask hey, the elders, your care group leaders, or oh, kid, how do I maintain my lamb? And the answer is through spiritual discipline. And the success is in the process. Spiritual discipline number one, prayer. As individuals, as families, as a church, come together, set up prayer altars. Tell the Lord that this time, this period, this tenure, we will come together. We will wait upon you. We will want to hear from you and then bring upon the Lord your petition and let's hear from the Lord what He wants to say to us and to our family. You know, friends, we need to be connected to God, you know. If you don't wait from the Lord, you will not receive from the Lord. And if you are not connected, you will run on empty. And uh, if you, I may use the analogy, a uh, new handphone, the top handphone now, S20, iPhone 13 or 11 or 12, yeah. You see, the handphone is rendered useless if it is not connected to the power. So for you to be effective, let's say you're the handphone, you have to be connected to our Lord through prayer. Spiritual discipline number two, worship in our daily lives, in how we should live and be dedicated to the Lord. John Piper, I just had a quote from him, true worship is about valuing or treasuring God above all things. Let me read that again. True worship is about valuing or treasuring God above all things. It is not about coming on Saturday or Sunday service, worship God and praise Him. It is about your daily life and how you live. When you go to work, when you speak to your friends, when you do your business, when you talk to your family members, your life is a worship. And the Lord looks for believers with inner worship because in Matthew 15 verse 8, He says that the people honour me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain they worship me. This means if you come on Saturday or Sunday and worship God and your heart from Monday to Friday does not leave to worship God, it is zero worship. You can do as many deeds as you want go to as many church services that you like and never be worshipping if it is all external and nothing is happening in your heart towards God. Spiritual, sorry, uh, spiritual discipline number three is the word. 
The scripture is very important. You got to fill your mind with God's promises, the assurance and his master plans. And you know what? I just want to share what uh, uh, Elder Ching Lok spoke about a month ago. You know, uh, the word of God is like putting the full armor of God and we need the word because the word is the sword and the sword pushes the enemy back. You can't be going to the battle and fighting halfway and then after that Satan is attacking, you say, oh, wait first, hold on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? Satan is not going to wait. He's going to crush you. Yeah. So when negative thoughts, evil thoughts come to you, if you do not have the scriptures to assure you who you are, like Jeremiah uh, 29 verse 11, uh, for I've, uh, sorry, I forgot that verse now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it is important that when we go to the battle, scriptures is our assurance of who we are and the authority and the power we have in Christ. Yeah. And finally, work. You got to walk the talk, serve the Lord. Don't just say you're a Christian. You've got to serve together collectively as one body. You know what? No matter how small your contribution, serve the Lord faithfully. We are all given a plot in our life to be faithful because when you are faithful in the little, much more will be given to you. And I just want to remind you one story, uh, one of my favorite heroes that was shared when I was uh, youth. Yeah. It is about the great mighty warriors of David. And uh, one of the top two, top two will be uh, Eliza, the other one was Shama. And 2 Samuel 23 is that, you know what, what happened? The Philistine was banded together and a lot of Israelites fled. But you know what? Shama, the mighty Mori, stood his ground in the middle of the field and he defended it and the Lord brought great victory. You think it was Shama who won the battle? I don't think so. Same goes for Eliza. The plus, uh, the, the plus time was uh, uh, advancing, but he stood his ground and he fought until his hand froze. And what happened? 800, uh, I think, first time was slain. And you think it was Shama who had, what, 10, 10 Kung Fu strengths or whatever, he was strong? No, the victory belonged to the Lord because the Lord fought for him. And same goes for us. You must find your battle position. You must stand your ground, serve faithfully, serve collectively. You do not look to your left, maybe they're flat. You look to your right, the ministry is cumbering. No, you stand faithfully, do your calling and, do, and serve the Lord faithfully. Don't be a spectator, spectator, but be spectacular in your battlefield and in your stage. And the church is not built by the talent of a few, but the sacrifice of many. And we serve better by being together. So these are the spiritual discipline that's something we should think about. And before I end, just a final one. I know it's been a bit long. Uh, for the church. Church, we are restarting. Uh, today is an encouragement to see that we are nearly full. We have 70 seats. I think we have about 50 to 60 here. But the question is right. SSGC, are you hibernating for the past five months? Yeah. Are you hibernating? Yeah. It is so easy for me, right, to Zoom on Sunday. One hour, I get dressed, I just sit Zoom, I don't need to come to church, and then after I go through the service, and then it's finished, and then I'm done. I've done my service on Sunday. This is not what church is about. Church is about God's people coming together, worshipping God collectively, and hearing His word, and receiving His blessing, and later on, we are supposed to move out to our community. It is not about Zooming just on Sunday in our private homes, private rooms, and with our family. I don't want to be presumptuous, but I know some of us can't attend. It's fine. But when the church opens, I encourage you to come back. Come back to encourage each other, to listen for the, to the Word of God, and then we move out to serve together again. Yeah. So, and I would just like to end with this verse. Yeah, it's such an encouragement. Yeah, Nehemiah 6 after the walls in 52 days that was rebuilt, uh, uh, Nehemiah 6.16, and uh, this is how it ended. When my enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their confidence because they realized that this work has been done with the help of our God. Oh, I'm going to repeat again. Okay. When the enemies heard that the walls were reconstructed, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their confidence because they realized that this work has been done with the help of our God. What can we learn? You know what? Enemies were afraid. They lost confidence. 
And you know what? God was glorified and the people realized that the work was done with God's protection and God's help. So when you rebuild your life, rebuild God's kingdom, there will be restoration that even, uh, uh, and when it's constructed, the restoration, even your enemies will fear you. Uh, will fear you. There will be opposition, no doubt. But you know what? Romans 8.31, if the Lord is with you, who can be against you? And when the presence of the Lord dwells with His people, His protection, His peace, His assurance, and His blessing will flow along. Yeah. So if you want a victory in your life, there's no shortcut, you know. You must rebuild your spiritual walls in your life, in your family, and in church. And when the Lord calls, when you call upon the Lord and seek the Lord to build your spiritual wall, our Lord will come to your life, to your family, to your church. And as Lawa said in Revelation 3.20, the Lord knocks, behold, I knock. Whoever hears my voice, open the doors. I will come to him and I will eat with him. Yeah. So in conclusion, whether we are new Christians or as a church, let us come this morning this afternoon to ponder how are you going to restart and reboot your life? We should restart by repentance, acknowledging that we need God and seeking God for a new direction. We should return to our first love and we should restore God in our life and in church. And in return, what is God's promise? The promise from our Lord is that when we restart with God as King, as number one, His presence will be in our life, in our family, in our church. And when the Lord is with us, His presence will bring peace, joy, rest, transformation, blessing, protection, and assurance on who we are. Yeah. So my challenge this afternoon that uh, if the Lord has spoken to you, let's spend a short moment, yeah, just do a reflection to say that, Lord, how do I reboot and how do I restart? Yeah. This afternoon, if the Lord has spoken to you and you say, Lord, I would like to reboot and restart, I encourage you to take a step of faith. Yeah. Take a step forward. You know what? Maybe to raise your hand this afternoon and to say, Lord, I want to reboot and restart by putting you first again. Yeah. If there's anyone here, uh, I'd just like to challenge or in your homes that you want to receive from the Lord, maybe you can just raise your hand and we can pray this prayer together. Yeah. It's just between you and God. It's not between me, you and me or you with the church is you and God. How do you want to reboot and restart your life? Let's commit this time to the Lord. If you want to pray this prayer, just raise your hand and I'll just close in a word of prayer. Anyone? Thank you. Thank you. The Lord honours those who raise His hand because He knows your heart and your desire. As you honour Him and take the step forward, he will begin the work in your life. Yeah. I'm going to close with this word of prayer and then I'll just commit a short time to our worship leaders. Yeah. Let's pray together for those who have raised their hands here and at home. Dear Lord Jesus, forgive me if I've forsaken my first love and not put you first in my life. This afternoon, I come to you again in humility to repent and say I'm sorry and invite you in my life again. I want to put you first in my life again and I invite you in my family, into my life, into my ministry, that you will be the Lord and King again. So help me, Lord. I also invite the Holy Spirit into my life to guide me and to live a new life. And as I reboot, O oh Lord, may I run with a new purpose, with clarity of knowing who I am and who do I live for and serve. So I make this public declaration this afternoon Lord Jesus, teach me on what needs to be done in my life to rebuild my life and your kingdom. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.
Thank you, Kit, for the message, and we thank God for His Word for us uh, today. Now, uh, if you are new to SSGC, or you have a prayer request, or you have a testimony that you want to share, that you want to give glory uh, to God for, uh, do share with us, and you can uh, visit us on our website and share with us, all right? And, or, or alternatively, uh, you can uh, click on the link that is found on your screen. So as we end uh, today's service, may you go forth and bear fruit in accordance with repentance. May you fortify your spiritual life and may you rejoice in the Lord always. And may God, our Father, rejoice over you with gladness. May Jesus Christ renew you in His love. And may the Holy Spirit give you peace that transcends all understanding that guards our heart and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us rise to our closing song. child in all of you I will live